The City of Grand Forks, Proud Home University of North Dakota, Special City Council meeting Monday, March 30th, 2020. It's here by call to order. Welcome and roll call. Okay, Weigel. If you could unmute to, for the roll call. Here. All right. Uh, Dockler? Here. Weber? Here. Mock? Here. Marshall? Sandy, if you could unmute. Okay, there, there we go. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, yes, Sorry, yeah. I just need the audio for the record. Thank you. Um, Sandy. Dana, yes, I'm here. And uh, Veen. Here. All right, we have a quorum, everybody's present. Thank you. Under mayor's comments, uh, we had two confirmed COVID-19 cases in Grand Forks County as of 3 p.m. So again, that emphasizes that people need to stay home. And if you need to leave home, you practice physical distancing and wash your hands for 20 seconds with hot soapy water when you get home. Um, our staff is working tirelessly during this time to maintain our objectives of protecting and serving in our community. Tonight, we're gonna to hear briefings and updates from our flood action planning city engineer, Al Grasser, our COVID-19 update with Debbie Swanson and our public health. Finance Director Maureen Storstead will give an update. Community and Economic Development Meredith Richards will give an update. A census update from Brad Gangler and then city administrative updates from Todd Phelan. With that, we go to action two, uh, action items 2.1. We have the flood response situational update by Al Grasser, city engineer. Mr. Grasser. Hey, good morning, mayor, members of city council. Good day. Good evening, <laughs> something like that. Uh, you have before you uh, basically four different items that are going to, we're gonna talk about on the flood protection update. I may take them a little out of order as far as they, they uh, appear on your agenda. Uh, if it's okay with everybody, I'm gonna start with, I believe item C, which is the flood protection limits. That's the map. It shows the perimeter of the, of the flood. And I'll give you a couple seconds here to maybe pull that one up. I think it's item C on the agenda. So you've probably seen this uh, map before. We've talked about it uh, in times past. This is an overview of what the uh, flood protection uh, system really consists of for the city of Grand Forks. Just in general overview, the, the areas along the river are made up of a series of, of earthen levees and flood walls. Flood walls are generally in locations where uh, there was a, a concern, a problem with uh, the soil stability, and they didn't, uh, the soils couldn't bear the weight of a full-fledged earthen levee. So to reduce weight, flood walls went in. And so that's generally why most of those flood walls are where they are. If you look along the northern perimeter of the, of the map, that's the- Mr. Grasser? Yes, sir. On a technical part, I don't see a map. Oh. Maybe others do, but I don't see one. Nobody else has it either? Al, I just pulled up the agenda on the internet and, and went to item C, so I'm looking at it myself on the city's website. Okay. But if you're trying to share your screen, I'm not seeing it either. No, I, I, I wasn't doing screen sharing. I was, I was just going to refer to what was in the packet. I'll be continuing that. Uh, I'm not all that tech sa savvy, sorry. <laughs> anyway, even if you don't have the, uh, the actual map up, I'll continue just to talk about it. Along, along the northerly edge, you have the English Cooley Diversion Channel. You've probably heard us talk about that. That's... What that does is intercept some of the overland flow uh, water that otherwise would go through the city of Grand Forks and into the English Cooley. That water is now, uh, because there's such a large volume of it, it gets uh, diverted around the city so that our English Cooley pump station only needs to be sized to cover the uh, runoff and rainwater that's coming in uh, within the city itself. Jumping way to the south end of the map, You'll see along Merrifield Road, there's a line there. That is basically our cutoff levee 
what that means is it's it's there to cut the river from coming around behind us. And if you know Merrifield Road, that's a rural section uh, that had been built up as part of the flood protection project, but it also is kind of naturally high. So that's kind of our southern uh, boundary of the project. Also on the map, if you pull it up, there's there's all kinds of notations about uh, pump stations and gate valves and, and up and overs and things like that. Um, just touching bases on those a little bit. To when the when the river gets high, the water would automatically want to back into our storm sewer system, which obviously we have to prevent. So to prevent that, the Corps of Engineers they install these pump stations and large uh, gates that would go down and and basically shut the, the river off from getting getting into, into town. Um, but to handle the runoff and any potential rain while they're shut down, the, uh, there are very large pump stations in there uh, with backup generators. I don't know if you, I think on Facebook, we actually had uh, some pictures of uh, some of the uh, stormwater staff, these, these pump stations during the winter time, they, they actually build up ice in the bottom and they have to go in there and they have to cut that ice out in order for those gates to actually close. I think there was something on a web or a Facebook on, on some of the crew doing that. Uh, so th there's more to a lot of this than, than just kind of what the, uh, the title would imply. I think there was something I saw on, on the news tonight uh, where they, they showed uh, one of the road closures. Uh, the first one that goes in is down in Riverside and that one just went up uh, today. So the street department crew puts those up. Those are a series of, of, of aluminum beams with gaskets on them that they, they basically stack where a, a road or a pedestrian uh, access would be. And again, that prevents the water from, from backing into town. With that, I'll probably quit on the map. For those of you that are looking at it, would there be any questions on that particular item? Okay. Then I will jump to item B is in boy. For those that are able to pull it up. This is our flood action sheet. The, you'll see this is just a whole series of tasks of items that need to be addressed. And they're, they're basically in uh, elevation order uh, from top to bottom. Uh, some of the earliest things you need to address and the bottom would be some of the latest things that you need to address. In other words, lowest in elevation, highest in elevation, generally speaking. The basis of this document came from the Corps of Engineers as part of our operational plan uh, that came with the flood protection project. Uh, lots and lots of tasks, I won't go through here, but they, they give actually a location of, of tasks that's been done, the, the this thing right now is color coded so that some of the various public work departments and others can, can see who's responsible for that particular activity. Um, you know, it's just a handy reference guide for everybody when you're uh, going on doing that, uh, that work. There's also a lot of other information in here that, again, on CF, there's a lot of things that mean things to the engineers and, and, and the implementers um, during. We're developing the situation as we're reacting to the river. Uh, for instance, uh, the Merge Avenue uh, obviously is a very important solution there. According to the Corps of Engineers, we should be assembling and installing those stop logs six feet above before the, the floodwaters get there. And that's the general plan. However, because we're around the flood crest, if you think of the flood crest, it is going to be below the sill of that opening. We will be laid out opening, um, and especially we do put down here the low points are uh, in the local book. So again, because that's so important to the cost between the communities and the states, uh, if the press is near that, we will make some good and set up another to put a little final stop log on. Conversely, if the water is coming up strongly, uh, the variety is coming strongly, we will. Um, Al, would you please talk? We have technical difficulties. Oh, we have okay. more Please hold while John fixes it. I hope it's not me. <laughs> we, we, want you, we want you to go back to the part where you said good evening. 
<laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so, John will let me know when it's safe to proceed. Unfortunately, it out. It is your mic. Oh, let me uh, let me try a mic. Is this any better? So proceed, we'll try. Okay. So unless there's any questions, I think I'm gonna, I'll probably stop there. The next item that you have on the agenda is actually item A, which is the administrative task list. This is a list of the different activities that we would uh, do that are not maybe technical in nature. We develop those in-house based on past flood experiences uh, as the various things that need to be done. Uh, and again, uh, for instance, uh, we had our first flood protection meeting on uh, February 14th. And if you remember on February 14th, we were, we were still at a point where we were expecting a very, very large flood. Uh, actually had some potential uh, low probabilities of, of, of exceeding our, our dike elevation. And to give you an idea, that it's a, it's a large participating group that uh, is, is in that flood meeting. I'm just going to go through a few of them. I might miss somebody, but uh, we have police, fire, public works, uh, street, storm, and water, uh, finance, engineering, electrical division, park district, EOC, state DEM, uh, County Health, All True, All True Ambulance, UND, East Grand Forks, Red Cross, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, North Dakota DOT. So there's quite a large group of people that get together uh, when we're talking a flood of this magnitude um, that we're uh, collaborating with. At our first meeting, we identified uh, a couple of significant items that we needed to talk about administratively. Uh, one of that is the incident command uh, system, uh, incident commander, which was identified as Todd, and you'll see that on the, on the incident command uh, uh, layout sheet later on. Uh, we also uh, identified and worked with uh, uh, Chief Lorenz and Chief Nelson, our coordinating uh, people with the, the UAS industry, as far as uh, working with who's going to do what, uh, UAVs and UAS. We talked about the Shady Ridge area and and, and, and different uh, alternatives and neighborhood meetings. Uh, worked out the city policy on sandbag details along and coordinated that with the county. Um, we also, not part of that particular meeting, but as part of that concern for the height of that uh, flood fight, we did also hire an engineering firm to, to look at evaluating our uh, the implementation strategies for a three-foot uh, flood raise. If you remember right, the flood walls that we have in town are good to uh, build to an elevation gauge of about 63 feet. The top of the levees are about 60. Design water elevation is 57. So we wanted to update that uh, just to make sure we, we understood uh, what kind of lead times we might need to have if we indeed needed to implement something like that. Uh, we also uh, had them look at other uh, flood fighting uh, scenarios uh, on the Shady Ridge area. And those documents are still basically being produced and, and drafted. And I think at some point we will bring those back uh, just to the city council for your awareness. Kind of this current situation right now is is we uh, fortunately we've had really almost a perfect uh, snow melt and lack of precipitation up to this date. The rivers in the in the southern end of the valley are, are all coming in at the low end of the probability curves uh, that the National Weather Service put out uh, back in February and March. Right now, the the uh, the curve for Grand Forks starts to show us. Brings us to about 43 feet or so, uh, on, but still on a continuing rising curve. So the 
the rivers will be cresting in the southern part of the valley this week. We're rising in the, in the middle part and the northern part of the valley, obviously. Again, we, uh, we're, we're in contact with the National Weather Service every day. Uh, they, they are setting up some web, webinars and conference calls periodically. And uh, so, we're, again, we're staying on top of things from that perspective, uh, adjusting the flood fight as we need it. Um, there is a weather system we're keeping an eye on uh, towards the end of the week, about Thursday, that looks to be fairly substantial. So, uh, again, we're keeping an eye on that, this to, if that, that may move the dial on, on some of the flood uh, crests um, if we get a, a larger precipitation. That one looks to be a rain and snow mixture, so it depends where the rain snow line is. Uh, obviously, if it comes in as snow, uh, the same amount of water will be released more slowly than if it comes in as rain. So uh, again, it just makes a difference on the, on the crest predictions. With that, I don't know how my audio all came out, but if there's any questions, I'll take a shot at answering them. Any, thank you. That's good news, Al. Any questions for Mr. Grasser? Uh, I have a couple questions, Mayor. This is Ken. Yes. Al, I noticed that it looks like if you look at the curves in the weather service, that it's going to be a huge rise between, uh, let's see, looking here about um, March 30th, um, are you, when do you expect to have all the road closures in? The, the road closures, they've actually started some of those, like I said, today uh, would be Riverside. They're going to continue to start uh, doing some of the, setting up some of the closures on some of the non-critical locations, like, like pedestrian accesses, maybe in the greenway, some of those types of things. The actual road closures, I think, are, are probably going to be uh, later on this week. Again, they, what they usually do on Demers Avenue is we'll set up some of the stop logs on the on the sidewalks and stuff like that, but leave the actual roadway open until we have more clarity as, as to exactly where that crest is going to come out. But the street crews are, are very diligent. They are getting very, very good at being able to put those up in court order. So, so Al, you said in, in the Southern Basin, the probabilities were fairly low. Um, what percent were most of them coming in at? Do you have an idea? Uh, I looked at them. I think uh, a lot of them are coming in between the 90 and 95 uh, exceedance level, okay. which is the low end of the elevation side. Um, the dangerous, remember this exceedance stuff that the Weather Service puts out is almost intuitively opposite of what you might think. Right. The, the dangerous ones are the, are the five and the, the percent items okay no that that's helpful because that looks like if if that remained we might be under 46 feet it looks like for a, a crest versus where we were up at 50 and above but i mean if that trend continues and obviously we don't know and there's many variables so that that would be good news as we continue as, as you look at the exceedance level because one of my other questions is, would we ever look at the railroad closing? And right now, that doesn't look like that's going to ever get to the height as we know it today to impact the railroad. Yeah, if I remember right, I think they're uh, good to about 50 feet. And so right now, again, they're going to be in the in the in the communication loop. If it looks like something changes and we need to get into those elevations, uh, they are ready to react pretty quickly. Okay. Um, the the other question I guess I had was on the incident command structure. I, I like the way you're set up. That seems to make really good sense. And it, it especially makes good sense is with the low uh, elevations, water elevations that we're looking at. Because do you have backup people in case this become, ever became a 24-7 operation? Yes, we have. I know speaking... Uh, more, you know, we, we've got departments in there, and, and most of those departments have additional personnel that they can bring into play. And plus, we can tap other departments even within the city. Uh, on the engineering side specifically, uh, we, we can tap the uh, consulting uh, expertise also. 
do you expect that you will be going 24 seven in the EOC? I don't think so at this point in time. Again, that would be a, an, an item that we would refine um, with the EOC uh, people, uh, Kari basically. Uh, again, it's gonna get to be the rate of rise and how high do we think it's going to go. Um, right now, I'm not sure we would go to a 24. I'd have to go look at my admin layout, but I don't think we're at a 24 hour operation at the levels we're anticipating right now. Yeah, it, it just looks like the, the higher your exceedance probability is, it looks like the sooner the flood would hit versus the bigger floods, which would be out a couple more weeks in comparison. Yeah, right Right now I would I would say we're, uh, well, I shouldn't say, I don't like to give predictions, but yeah, I don't think, I don't think we're too far out from the press. Yeah, okay. I think that's, that's my question. Thanks, Al. Okay. Thank you, Mr. V. And who else would like questions for Mr. Grasser? Mr. Weber. Yes, Mr. Grasser. I know that uh, last year uh, we had a fantastic collaborative effort between the city, especially uh, under Chief Lorenz and the fire department uh, with uh, UND's aerospace, uh, local uh, uh, private industry and others engaging UAS to help us with the flood fight. That gained some national attention. Uh, and I, I believe it was particularly valuable in terms of uh, uh, bridge inspections and other uh, applications that allowed us to move forward out of the uh, the spring flood in a, a more timely fashion. Are we doing something along those lines again this year? We are, again, we're standing by uh, relative to how high the, the flood goes, but uh, Keith Lorenz and, and Nelson, they, uh, we, we've got agreements with uh, um, people to coordinate the UAS activities. Uh, there's lots of people that might like to get involved. We actually have them prioritizing what might be the best craft and organization to do a specific activity. The bridge inspection actually, I believe last year was done by the, the Jewish themselves. So those are state high, the, the, the Mers Avenue State Highway. I believe they use their own uh, UAV for that inspection. Oh, okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Any further questions for Mr. Grasser? Hearing none, we move on to item 2.2. 2.2, um, we'll start with A, human resource update from Tanji. Were we gonna go with 2.2 COVID-19 situation update? Yes. Um, Debbie Swanson. Ms. Swanson. I'm ready. Thank you. Mayor Brown and members of the council, I'm Debbie Swanson, Grand Forks Public Health Department Director. Uh, and I also want to welcome the members of the public that are watching this evening too. I have a short presentation that I'll be providing and I'll be asking the Public Information Center to share that presentation. And for those of you that are out in the audience, You'll be able to see this presentation by going to the Grand Forks City website and clicking on the government tab and then the meetings and agendas. At that point, you can follow along or you can watch on this live feed as well. We will also post this update on the Grand Forks Public Health Department webpage tomorrow morning. So you've been hearing a lot about the novel coronavirus. The disease that it causes is called the COVID-19, and this is my update. Uh, next slide, please. This is the global overview of the coronavirus, and this is from the um, John Hopkins University, but it's populated with data from the World Health Organization and other sources. As you can see, there's 741,000 cases worldwide and the US now has the most cases of all countries reporting at 143,000 plus. There you can also see the trajectory of the disease and how much it has increased since the beginning, uh, which would have been uh, back in late December, early January. You can go to the next slide, please. 
This is the national coronavirus overview um, that shows uh, the US cases. You can see that it's a little bit more concentrated in the Pacific Northwest, the West Coast, and then the East Coast and is moving towards the center of our country. Uh, that just shows kind of the progression of the areas. In case you're wondering why the countries of uh, Africa and South America and even Australia do not have as much spread, it's because they're in a different season. And we believe that this virus may ultimately be a seasonal virus and it may be circulating more in the Southern hemisphere uh, during their winter, which will be our summer months. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the statewide coronavirus overview. Uh, there were 11 positive test results today for a total test completed today of 113. So you can see the number per day has increased a little bit. The total positive cases in North Dakota is 109. This was of as of nine o'clock this morning, there's been an update. And unfortunately our deaths now are at three statewide. Uh, there is 18 people that are hospitalized and 19 people are recovered. And those people who are recovered have recovered from the disease and are no longer in any form of an isolation status. Next slide, please. Um, this shows the number of tests that have been done uh, in each of the larger counties where cases are being reported. And you'll notice that there's a significantly higher percentage of cases, or excuse me, tests, in Burley and Cass County. And the reason is because those counties plus Morton County had a higher uh, a number of initial cases reported. And those initial cases are now in the contact investigation period. And so it's uh, likely that there are more people being tested as a result of that contact investigation. Today, we learned of the first two cases identified in Grand Forks County, that was this morning, a woman in her 30s and a man in his 30s and both of them are in that period of under investigation. So the source is not known as to whether it was travel related or community spread. Next slide, please. Uh, this is overall total for North Dakota, the source of exposure. So uh, eight cases are considered close contact. Those are likely family members, coworkers, people that have close contact with the positive cases. Possible travel is nine. 20 are under investigation, and there you can see travel is 27. So that's why you're seeing lots of changes related to guidance on travel because that number has increased. But more importantly is that community spread at 45. And community spread happens when someone who has reported to the health department uh, through a contact investigation and they have no idea uh, why they have uh, tested positive. When we have large community spread, that's when we need to move to further efforts to contain the disease. Next slide, please. I think this is also an important piece of information for us to consider. This disease does not seem to be a disease of children. While they might be vectors, we're not finding a lot of positive cases in those zero to 19, both of those age groups but we are seeing a fair number in the 20 to 29 and 30 to 39. And then moving on out, there are fewer cases in the elderly, but we do know that the elderly and people with other chronic diseases are more likely uh, to succumb to the disease or to have complications and require hospitalization. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a really important slide as well because this tells us about the vulnerable populations that are out there. These are people that are more likely uh, to be at risk, not necessarily of contracting the disease, but having complications uh, once it does occur or they test positive. So uh, these are the percentage of people within Grand Forks County that are either smokers, have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, mental health conditions, or are elderly defined as 85 or older. And there you can see the data point is from our behavioral risk factor survey in the US Census Bureau. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a really brief overview of what's happening in Minnesota. They've had a total of 576 positive uh, tests with about 18,822 
total tests, they've had 10 total deaths and 92 hospitalizations as of today. It started out in the metro area of the Twin Cities, but has moved across the state of Minnesota, just like as in North Dakota. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide about the logistics for the North Dakota healthcare system. Oftentimes people ask about the fact that this disease can be so severe and have uh, serious complications and people require hospitalization. We are always monitoring the number of beds that are available, what's happening in our long-term care facilities, and what's the status of our healthcare workforce, the people that will be on the front lines to take care of those who become ill. So there's a lot of data on this slide, but I think you can see that we have a pretty uh, robust uh, number of healthcare workforce. But our goal here is to keep that workforce healthy and unexposed so that they can remain on the job and take care of any individuals that would become ill. A really important part of our workforce is not only physicians and mid-level providers and nurses, but respiratory therapists, because they are also the people that will be needed when we have ventilators in use. And it's anticipated that a large number of people who would require ICU care would need ventilators. And the total number in North Dakota is 408. Uh, next slide, please. These are a couple of uh, recent orders that have been uh, issued by either the governor or the state health officer. And these are some media messages that we've been using. We've actually been recommending for the very since the very beginning that travelers completed a survey and assess their risk for the potential exposure while they were traveling in another state. We recommend now that people do that travel survey. There are about 23 states in the United States that have high incidence. Those are in the red states on the uh, block on the right side. And that those in those states, individuals should definitely stay home for 14 days. And that's that travel related slide that I showed earlier that seems to be creating uh, more risk for people having contracted it, just traveling from those states. We recognize this is a huge sacrifice for people and we recognize that this is going to be a burden. And I believe our community has really risen to the challenge to making sure that we can help people who are in this situation and individuals should not be afraid to reach out for assistance if they need it. Next slide. Uh, this is maybe a little bit hard to see, but we did want to show you that Grand Forks Public Health Department has moved into our incident command system, just as you learned of flood has incident command. We also have incident command and I am in the role of the public health incident commander. We also have a crisis communication team and we established that according to our emergency operations plan. And we've been busy uh, vetting information and disseminating it out to the public as soon as we're able to. We're issuing situation reports on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and we will likely go to daily situation reports fairly soon here, coordinating a lot of social media with the City of Grand Forks Public Information Center, and then doing the media interviews and now the news conferences that are held daily at 215. We also participate in statewide joint information center calls and joint information centers are at the state level and it includes a lot of organizations that all have public information officers. There's a tremendous amount of work going on behind the scenes. So if you advance to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit more about those activities. Uh, we do daily briefings with our leadership team and then also with city departments. We participate, as I mentioned already, in the virtual news conferences. And we just added a daily briefing now at 11 o'clock in the morning to increase our communication with all true and UND and the Grand Forks Air Force Base, recognizing that they're large entities and we need to be aware of how we can support one another and what their logistical challenges might be. Uh, since the very beginning, or at least since the 17th of March, we've been staffing a hotline at the Grand Forks Public Health Department phone. Because we are all working virtually with few exceptions, and it has worked fairly well with the support of city government, uh, we have our telephones rolled over to personal cell phones or city-established cell phones. 
We're doing a lot of our work virtually using our computers, laptops, iPads, um, any device that we can get our hands on. A huge part of what we anticipate that we'll be doing in the next uh, several weeks will be that contact tracing that I mentioned before. And this will be assisting the North Dakota Department of Health. We have an epidemiologist who's housed in our office. It's working virtually, uh, but uh, we will be assisting him with all of the efforts to find people who have tested positive, uh, find their contacts, and then uh, reach out to those contacts and make sure they get tested if it's appropriate and quarantine for certain. Uh, next slide. We're also doing coordination with the North Dakota Department of Health. An unanticipated task that I think I mentioned before was that we have been uh, coordinating some specimen transports when they are expedited. So if there's a healthcare worker that's tested and it needs to get to the lab in Bismarck much more quickly, we are responsible for doing that. We've engaged our mosquito control program to help us. A lot of prevention messaging for all of our stakeholders. What you might not be aware of is that there's a state cache with supplies and today they mobilized about 40% of that state cache to all the regional hospitals across the state and Ultra reported that they received 33 pallets of supplies, personal protective equipment and a whole lot of hospital supplies that they will need for the future. We also uh, receive requests from a number of agencies that are looking for assets and we help them through that process, which is a completely online process and the National Guard has been tasked with helping to get all of those orders out. And then we are working with our local public health units with outreach and support. We recognize that all of those counties surrounding us have much smaller health departments and staff and uh, we're offering resources that we have to help them because we recognize that this virus doesn't know borders and it will move within our region as well as within our state. And so we all need to coordinate and work together. And then providing healthcare system support is really critical. Uh, the hospitals are working on their surge capacity and we need to help support that in any way that that makes sense for them to coordinate. I already mentioned the state cash asset coordination and then fit testing for N95 masks. While we're not doing that now because we want to preserve that supply, we did a lot of fit testing for healthcare providers and organizations that are on the front lines prior to the uh, virus emerging in the United States. So we feel like we did some good prevention work there so that all of our frontline providers to the greatest of our ability have had some fit testing. Fit testing is when you put the mask on and making sure that it fits your face well so that no air escapes and so that you're adequately protected from the virus. Recognizing that another element of uh, security is also and, and safety for healthcare providers is also those fomites that land on supplies and things and so making sure that the droplets spread when it lands on items is cleaned well. And there's been a tremendous amount of focus on that aspect of how this virus spreads as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we've been having daily meetings with Pemina, Nelson, Griggs and Walsh counties. They are in what's called our regional emergency preparedness response unit. And we started eight o'clock meetings with them just prior to meetings that we have with all health departments at 8.30 in the morning. And that those have both been very beneficial to sharing information and best practices. And then ongoing throughout actually many years, we've had a public health emergency preparedness coalition. And we're now moving to weekly meetings with that group. It includes our regional partners, schools, higher education, hospitals, Clinics, there are a number of clinics that are outside the all true health system in our county that we support and attend those meetings. Uh, all the public health departments, long term care, public information officers, the schools, the base, UND, and the city all have public information officers, and then any other governmental organizations like the county, this uh, park district, um, and many others as well. Next slide, please. This is just an example of some of our early messaging on social distancing. 
I know we're trying to find new words for social distancing so that we make sure people stay socially connected, even if they are not geographically close to one another. And the personal responsibility that comes with washing your hands, covering your cough, cleaning surfaces, and then avoiding that close contact. And I, I can't stress enough how very, very important these actions are. They seem simple, but they are the best tools that we have when we have a novel virus for which we have no vaccine. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this one provides all the hotline information. The North Dakota Department of Health has a public hotline that members of the public can call. And I believe that's operating from about seven in the morning till about 10 at night. They've set up a separate hotline just for long-term care facilities. And then just for providers like physicians, uh, frontline providers like nurse practitioners can call to get more technical advice and information. Altru has had a screening hotline for a few weeks now where patients of their system can call uh, to get information about testing when it's available, screening for testing. And then as I mentioned before, Grand Forks Public Health Department. And next slide. These last two slides just provide a lot of resources. I wanted you to see that these are all places that we are going to, uh, for information whenever we advise the public, we're referring the public to these places. One that I think is very invaluable is the second one down, the North Dakota Department of Health Frequently Asked Questions. They have just about every question you could imagine is answered on that uh, particular page. And it's part of the North Dakota Department of Health coronavirus section, but then you have to scroll down a little bit farther and click on the frequently asked questions block. And it, they have everything from how to file um, unemployment claims to small business information, workers comp, in addition to all the health information that we're readily providing as well. So I highly recommend checking that out. And then next slide is just a few more resources. Uh, I would like to point out that the North Dakota Behavioral and Mental Health Resources page has places where people can go to get information if they need any type of support for behavioral health. If they're looking for an online virtual uh, support group, those are all listed there. There's uh, peer support counseling that's still available by telephone for people with substance use disorders. So we've really found lots of ways to connect and provide, continue to provide care for individuals across the state of North Dakota. I left a blank on the next slide because I just wanted to leave it blank because I'm sure we'll be adding more resources as we hear about them. We know that there's lots of activity on social media. There's some social media sites that are offering information and assistance to residents. And I will end there in, offer the rest of my time for any questions that you might have. I'm going to mute myself because I do hear an anxious puppy in the background and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you. That was an excellent update. I assume it's available on your webpage because I'm sure people are going to want to refer to it. Yeah, we'll make it available, if not this evening, uh, for sure by tomorrow morning. Thank you. And again, stay home. And if you can't stay home, practice physical distancing. Wash your hands and be vigilant, be safe. Now questions from the group. Mr. Sandy. Hi, Mayor, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Swanson, for that uh, very detailed and, and uh, excellent presentation. Um, I'm wondering why, isn't, uh, why doesn't the state provide demographics on the people who are hospitalized? Why is there not more public information so that people know, um, in, in my opinion, um, there's still lots of social gathering going on, not only in our community, across our state, as well as across uh, uh, the country. I think if people knew more about the people that were being hospitalized and could personalize it, they would be less apt to be out socializing and social gathering. Um, I, if I were the state, I would be telling everyone, here are the people that are being hospitalized, even if it's if they're all in the same de demographic, if it's all 80 people or people that are over 80 years old or 
Alternatively, it's a wide gamut of all different ages and genders of people. Either way, it sends a very clear message to the general public about um, those loved ones. They can personalize it and, and think of their grandparents or think of their brother and sister or, or their friends or cousins. But for some reason, our state isn't doing that. Is that because of legal issues or simply because unlike the way I feel about it, they're concerned that if you tell people what the demographics are, those that don't fit in those demographics won't heed the warnings. Well, yeah. I would agree with you that there are perhaps uh, situations where people are not following our advice. We, we know that that is the case. However, I'm not sure that releasing where people are hospitalized uh, would be that the appropriate response to that. I also do know that there are privacy laws and when you get to a state like North Dakota where you might have a one critical access hospital in a county that's fairly small and they're hospitalizing one person, it, would, it might be fairly easy to figure out who that is. Um, that's just the rural nature of our state. So I think it will be a long time before we'll see that information. I could be wrong, they might decide to do that uh, sooner rather than later, but that's what has been explained to me. And if I can get a further answer from the state health department, I will do that. I, will I think, yes, thank you. I think you misunderstood my question. Um, why are we not hearing the ages of the people that are hospitalized? I don't think it matters where they are. I want to know what people are so that um, my neighbors can hear that people that are their age are being hospitalized so that they can personalize it. Okay, I understand your question now. You said ages. I thought you meant locations. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Sorry. Ages, they may be able to do that. I can, I can follow up on that. I, would, I, I personally believe that um, as a state, we should be telling people the ages and the, the genders of the people that are being hospitalized. I believe that if it were, if it's all people that are 80 years old, or if it's a general cross section of the population, either way, it's, it will strike a chord with people and they will recognize and be able to personalize that it could be my cousin or it could be my grandfather or it could be my brother. I just personally believe that um, people will be more apt to follow the recommendations if they have a better understanding of the people that are, that are having the problems. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any further questions for Ms. Swanson? John, can we see the council? Hey, Mayor, as long as uh, nobody else is asking for the floor, I can ask you a question. What, what are your thoughts about the people in our community that aren't seeming to get the hint? about uh, congregating. Um, how can we as uh, uh, community leaders express to people the importance of social distancing? Well, I, I think our police department said today that they would be monitoring that. If they had lar larger gatherings than 10, they would inform them that they're being irresponsible. So I think we just need to be consistent with our message uh, especially in light of two confirmed COVID cases in our county. So I think we need to be consistent with our messaging and our first responders also will help us. I think, uh, thank you, Mayor. I think it's very difficult um, for people to uh, tell their, their neighbors or their friends that they're probably not doing things the right way. Um, yeah just the nature of friendships and neighbors. And even though um, not everybody in Grand, even in Grand Forks, not everybody knows their neighbors anymore. Like we did, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, it's still very difficult to, uh, um, to go directly and tell your neighbors, you think, you think they're not doing what's right. Um, I'm not suggesting this, but I, I believe that the, uh, the police department was seeing an uptick in, um, uh, calls for loud parties. Do you, do you recall that? Is that is that true? I uh, I almost wonder if people in uh, in our community are using that as an avenue to make uh, the police department as well as the city aware of 
places and groups where where people are acting inappropriately. So I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to call the police when they see a group of people out on their bicycle, but um, it certainly would be an avenue to notify uh, the Grand Forks authorities if people are routinely seeing um, gatherings that certainly don't fit within the guidelines of what the state is saying or, or what you've been saying, Mr. Mayor. Just an observation. Thank you. Any further questions for Ms. Swanson? Well, I see that Deb's video is gone, um, but I do also want to just bring up a question for you about children. I know that a lot of kids are going stir crazy. I have three of my own at home that think that I am the worst person in the world because I'm not letting them go over to their friends' houses right now. Um, but I also know that pretty consistently there's a lot of kids in our community ranging in ages that are still getting together and going out and doing things. Some parents feel like, well, if their kids are going outside and biking or scooting around together, it's not a big deal because they can't, they can't, um, the virus isn't contagious if they're outside. And I have other people that have said things like, oh, well, if it's just one or two kids that are going to somebody else's house and we know them, then it's okay. What would you say to those parents and suggest to them as far as moving forward as we see these cases coming into Grand Forks and we know that we're in it pretty much for the long haul right now um, and trying to entertain our kids, educate our kids at home, all of these things. You know, I'm, I'm right there with a lot of other parents um, and I know that it's hard, but what would you say to them in order to try and, you know, curb the, flatten the curve for us here in Grand Forks? I think it's complicated messaging and I feel for parents that are trying to manage this. Uh, a lot of our staff are working and taking care of children and trying to school them at home as well. And it's very, very challenging. I think uh, mixing children together is a dangerous practice. It's like exposing them to a vaccine preventable disease. Um, you don't willingly do that to your child, expose them um, to things like measles in an effort to um, just uh, keep them occupied. I think it's scary, but I think it's a real risk. It's true that children may not get as sick and they may not be as affected by this disease, but I think we're seeing low numbers because we closed schools right away and we kept children away from each other from a very early on situation. Uh, so I think that's uh, one element why we're not seeing a lot of disease there. I think also it's really important to talk about the way the disease is spread. It's true you can be outside, walk the dog, um, ride your bike, rollerblade, but once you start adding children that are close together, closer than that six feet, you run the risk. But more importantly, children are not really great at washing their hands. And um, that's where the disease really spreads is on those surfaces, shared bike handles, uh, playground equipment, and then children will touch their face and that's how they can become infected. And we have to remember that we have no immunity to this virus. Unlike a lot of things that children have immunity because it's passed on to them from their mother at birth, we don't have immunity to this disease. And so it's a risky practice to allow kids to, to mingle, I think. And it's gonna be hard and it's gonna get harder. Um, just one thing before you pop in, Dana. Uh, you had mentioned about playgrounds. I know that a lot of parents have been thinking that if they just take just their, you know, nuclear unit family to the playground to get out and get the air and they stay away from other people, um, that that's okay and it's not going to cause problems. But it sounds like maybe that isn't a practice that people should be putting into effect right now. Is that correct or no? Well, I would sure be cautious about the surfaces that they touch and um, also washing hands after they play on that playground. Mr. Mayor, that I was going to follow up to to that line of conversation. Um, I was out um, in the downtown area earlier today around four o'clock, and there were I don't know somewhere between seven and ten um, young people at the skate park, all playing together. Um, I'm wondering if we've opened the line of communications with the park district. Um, I, I'm not saying we should close the parks. But I don't know where the park district is right now. Um, I haven't heard or seen anything from any, well, 
other than the county had an online meeting, I haven't heard, uh, well, and of course the school, school district's been pretty public. I haven't heard anything from the park district. I know they, of course, closed choice. They closed uh, the skating rinks early, um, but I don't know where they are with the rest of the parks and, and if they've had any thoughts or if they have a plan. So I think it'd be good if we can engage them to try to identify what it is that they're planning, perhaps maybe for your next press conference. Thank you, Mark. Mr. Phelan, make that contact. Any more questions for Ms. Swanson? Mayor, I have a question for Ms. Swanson. Yes, Mr. Weigel. Um, I had a gentleman reach out to me with some, some basic questions. And um, if you could just cover two quick things, has there been any talk about um, building a list of volunteers um, in case they're needed later on, later on down the road? Uh, are you thinking of volunteers specifically for certain tasks or generally? Uh, for certain tasks related to this, whether it be calling, trying to trace where people have been or anything along those lines. Uh, we have reached out to the, the public health program at UND to gain some assistance with our contact investigation activities. And so we're working through that. Uh, we've also um, know that the state is looking at activating the medical reserve corps, I believe is what they're called. And the Medical Reserve Corps is people who have uh, specific skills for uh, medical care. Uh, we haven't done just community volunteers like we do in a flood, like sandbagging, but I know that there's a lot of groups that are stepping up to help feed people and provide other supports that are needed. And I know the Public Information Center is gathering a lot of that information. Perfect. And then just one final thing. Can you walk through the steps if somebody were like, would like to get tested and how they'd go about doing that in case somebody's watching and wondering if they should be tested? Good reminder. Uh, we're referring people to call the All True hotline, especially if they are an All True patient. Uh, we know that patients of other facilities are also offering testing, but we strongly encourage people to call first. It's a very smooth process to be screened especially now that we have cases in our county, we know that people will need to be tested so that they will be prioritized. And uh, the screening process works really well. You call, uh, they give you an appointment time. You can have it done in your car unless you need to be seen in the clinic, in which case they'll also give you an appointment time. And it, it works very well. Perfect, thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry to interject. Uh, Brett reminded me, uh, I had visited with a couple of the uh, pastors in town um, who they are organizing themselves under the guidance of Pastor Paul Knight. Um, he helped spearhead a group post flood that did some volunteering around town. They're organizing themselves so that they will be available at the call for public health and or um, they've been in contact with uh, the senior center um, for the time when they perhaps might need some help with meal on, Meals on Wheels and even um, potentially uh, food preparation. So uh, I know that there are groups within our community that are already trying to organize themselves because we all know that having one clearinghouse for organizing all the people would be virtually impossible. So having uh, a group like um, the faith community doing that on their own and being prepared to help um, when when the call goes out for help, I think is very important for the community. Thank you, any further questions for Ms. Swanson? Um, yes. Mr. Mayor, I don't yes. know if this is necessarily for Ms. Swanson or maybe for Mr. Phelan, but if people are concerned, they lost their job, I know um, many of the unemployment benefits have changed and um, you qualify for different services than you would have in the past. Is there a place on the website that people can go to or should they just call job service directly? Mr. Phelan? I think that's a very good idea. We'll at least have a link on that. I know it, um, unemployment will be a, a state matter and uh, as we as has been discussed, it's gonna be rather robust, which is good um, from an unemployment benefit perspective, but 
Um, the state's going to handle that, but we'll at least have a, a link and we need to make sure our community partners like the EDC and the chamber also uh, are, are good communicators of, of what that may be too. So it's going to unroll here and within this week from what we've been told. And uh, we need to be at least supportive of that. And Mr. Mayor, if I may, I think uh, you'll find that uh, the next report uh, from Ms. Richards will cover a lot of those issues. Thank you. Um, along with that, can we have a link if people are struggling with food, they might not qualify for those things, but if they are at least struggling with some of those basic services where they can reach out to, there are a lot of organizations that have food pantries available, but they might not um, be as familiar with those services. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may, uh, okay. I think uh, perhaps Mr. Hager could talk to what uh, the, uh, 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 his, his staff have been doing in terms of providing updates about groceries and other food sources in the community. Mr. Hager. Oh. <clears throat> Sorry, I do think that if we can include um, information about how to contact Social Security too, since they are no longer taking in-person meetings as well, that would be helpful for a lot of individuals in the community that would maybe have questions about um, checks and things like that. Okay, noted. Mr. Hager, do you have anything to respond? Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate uh, the questions. And uh, yes, uh, to Mr. Weber's comment, uh, the, the public info team, uh, this one led by uh, Cheryl Simeone has done a really nice job coordinating with the social service agencies. There are uh, links, uh, live listings actually listed on the, the Grand Forks website under COVID resources for food, and that includes pantries and other types of uh, food deliveries and updates, uh, thanks to uh, both uh, Ms. Simeone and Councilmember Weber, daily updates from uh, grocers and uh, similar organizations about um, status of supplies and any status of hours too. So we are... Uh, tracking that information right now available on the website. I think as uh, Council Member Weber had said, I, um, Ms. Richards and her, um, her team will uh, be able to provide a, a great um, explanation of some of the um, business and economic support that is going on and, and that they are leading. Um, so we will be able to work with them, all of that on the website and the other information um, suggested today about uh, being able to reach out and have contact links and contact information. We're going to do our best to consolidate that as much as we can within the website as far as a, as far as a portal or an entry point, but really rely on all the great partnerships and the collaborations around the community to provide a lot more deeper information with our partners. Thank you. So any further questions for Ms. Swanson? Thank you. That was an excellent update. Now we'll go to 2.2 Alpha. So now we'll go on to the human resource, resource impacts update from our HR director, Tanji. Hi, thank you. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. First and foremost, I'd like to commend the mayor, um, city leaders, department mm -hmm. and employees for the tremendous job that's being done to keep this community safe and limit our exposure to COVID-19. Our department heads have been doing their best to keep employees informed and up to date as these situations change often very rapidly. Uh, virtual meetings are now our new norm. Uh, resources are sent directly out to staff regularly from public health, human resources, the mayor and city administrative team, and staff is encouraged to watch our virtual news conferences on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Some of the resources that are sent out to employees are um, include behavioral health information, employee assistance program information, health information includes, including sanitizing and hygienic practice information, links to state and federal resources, the list could go on and on. Um, our employees have been incredible. They're ready and willing to do whatever it takes to provide essential services for the city while maintaining a safe and effective work environment. Um, some of the policies that have been enacted in the last two weeks, the first was the mayor's um, first order, which 2020-1 um, regarding the leave policy for city employees. Right now, city employees shall receive paid administrative leave to the extent that such employee is unable to work or telework 
because he, um, there's a list of reasons, but um, if the employee is subject to quarantine or an isolation order, or if the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine, or the employee is on self-quarantine due to exposure to COVID or is seeking a diagnosis or treatment for COVID. Uh, the employee is caring for an individual who is subject to an order as specified um, above or has been advised um, and diagnosed with COVID-19. Or the employee is caring for a son or a daughter of such um, if the school or place of care of the son or daughter has been closed or the child care provider is unavailable due to COVID-19 precautions. So city departments were encouraged by the mayor to work with employees and provide opportunities for work from home, telework or partial or scattered shifts as much as possible. Um, so in addition to this paid administrative leave available to employees for all of those multitude of reasons, um, this was all sent out to the city council as well. Uh, the federal government has implemented a federal family's first COVID-19 act, which will be effective April 1st. So this um, guarantees all employees get are entitled to 80 hours of paid sick leave due to quarantine or experiencing COVID-19 symptoms or 80 hours of paid sick leave at two thirds rate to care for an individual subject to quarantine or care for a child whose school or daycare is closed due to COVID-19. So as you can see, the, admin, uh, the mayor's administrative order is more generous than the federal family's first policy um, the administrative leave policy that is an act um, from the mayor is subject to change as uh, necessity warrants, but we will never um, provide um, coverage less than what is covered than the federal family's first policy. So in addition to the um, 80 hours of paid sick leave, the, the federal family's first policy would um, guarantee employees an additional 10 weeks of paid family and medical leave um, at two thirds regular rate pay for anyone whose child, um, whose school or child health care or child care provider is closed due to COVID-19. Any questions on that before I continue? Does anyone have any questions? Do you have that in a simplified email form? Um, Yes, there's, there's a couple of different um, workplace posters that we distributed as well as our internal policy that's been updated. I can send that out again. Thank you. Yep. So the second, um, I'll move on to the another order or policy that was implemented, the governor's order implemented on March 25th regarding WSI coverage. Now this, um, this opens up um, WSI coverage for first responders and healthcare workers um, who are exposed and or, and or contract the COVID-19 um, virus from job related exposure. So this WSI, WSI will now cover medical costs and wage replacement for um, first responders and healthcare workers that are deemed to have been exposed or contracted COVID from job related exposure. Any questions on that policy? Okay. So I'll just give you a brief staffing report. As I said before, our department heads have been working diligently um, across the board to ensure that the safety of our employees um, is met while meeting the community's need for service. Our preservation of our staff is key. Numerous strategies have been employed to limit exposure to the public as well as limiting exposure to our employees. So currently we have 150 employees working as normal, but practicing increased hygienic practices and physical distancing. This would include departments such as fire suppression, water treatment, public transit, and public safety answering point. We have about 108 employees working from home, including departments such as assessing, engineering, IT, HR, finance, public health, planning and community de development and administrative staff across departments. 
We have about 211 employees that are working staggered, alternating interval shifts or as needed shifts um, to maintain staffing. This includes police, public works, mechanics, building maintenance, dial -a ride operators, and municipal court. We do have um, 26 employees re reporting directly to the field, including our electricians and inspectors, and about 75 people that still are coming um, periodically into city buildings like City Hall and Public Works. We only have one sub-department that um, has been closed and that's the Withdrawal Management Center. Um, everything else is at least available via phone. Um, these numbers that I provided are slightly greater than our active employee count, but several dozen employees fall into one or more categories. So that's why it seems a little high. So this week, we're going to further reduce staff access to city buildings and continue effective communications and maintain the ability to adapt and respond as necessary. Looking forward into 2020 and 2021 budgets, um, we'll be evaluating staffing levels and hiring practices, as well as our contract employees and evaluating cost-saving measures moving forward. Any questions? Any questions for Danji? Well, Danji, thank you. Real quick. Yeah. Oh, Mr. White. Just want to provide a little feedback. I've heard from some city employees and they're very thankful for everybody, um, people, yourself and people on your staff and uh, mayor yourself and, and so many people um, that have been involved in this. And um, I know they really feel like they're being taken care of and being looked out for um, from city leaders. So thank you for all that. Good. Well, people are our most important resource if we're going to protect and serve. So thank you, Tangie. Now we'll move on to 2.2 Bravo. All right, and that's the financial impacts update, which I will lead that discussion. Thank you, Mayor. Um, John, if you could just put up that budget performance summary um, from 2019. Um, and first of all, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, so... Before I get into the impacts of the COVID-19, I just wanted to give you a baseline to see where we were at in 2019. Um, so what you see is um, a draft uh, pre-audit numbers for the fourth uh, through the fourth quarter of 2019, starting with the general fund, um, as you see on the screen there, or you should see um, the revenue and how that breaks down um, by category. Um, some of these that I'll get into are a little more volatile than others, and that's um, what we're particularly concerned about with the economic impact um, of the COVID-19. Um, but as you can see, uh, total revenue um, for the general fund, about 40.4 million. Um, if you go down, John, a little bit further, you'll see um, that's matched by expenses of about 40.2. Um, so we came in uh, about, it's about 186,000 revenue over expense. Um, some of these categories you will see, um, we would have done a budget amendment for some of its timing just between um, the, the years um, with benefits. What um, brought that over is we had done an amendment from the prior year, if you remember, um, to do the 2018 um, remainder allocation for that defined benefit pension um, as we were able to do that at that time. So overall, um, with the general fund, um, revenues did meet expenditures and uh, for a net positive about 186,000. If we go down further, we just gave a very basic um, revenue to expense picture for you on each of the major utility funds. And um, going into this, um, everything looks pretty good there. So let me know um, after if, if you have any questions or if you have any questions now regarding this, but I can give you um, time to, to review that. And like I said, I'm, I'm here if you have any questions, but I wanted to give you just a snapshot first um, before I go into my other notes of um, numbers as far as um, what we've become accustomed to um, with our revenue and expense uh, picture there. But going into now, um, what we're looking at as far as impacts um, to the um, economic impacts of the COVID-19 and knowing those impacts will be quite significant on some of our uh, major um, revenue sources that are more volatile in nature. Um, we are reviewing all our funds. This isn't just general fund, but it spans across many funds 
Um, we're doing stress uh, test sensitivity analysis, um, just regarding these more volatile revenue streams of income for us. Um, we're looking at those by source and by fund and comparing those projected impacts um, with the 2020 budget to see what um, our gaps are. Um, some of these um, significant um, impacts are to our sales tax, our state aid, um, building and permit related fees, our highway user tax. Um, looking at, um, you know, initially we're looking at a possible 25 percent um, 2020 impact to those revenue streams. Um, like I said, we're looking at this uh, fund by fund on different scenarios, seeing where we can um, and how this impacts our general fund, our streets and infrastructure fund, our water fund, economic development fund, um, our Alara Center. We're working with all departments on where uh, we can find room to cut costs. We want to do this um, in a smart and prudent way. So we're working with all our departments on looking at travel, wages, uh, capital, fuel. Uh, we're working with the Alara Center and Spectra and reviewing uh, financial analysis there and staffing and action plan uh, for their operations and capital. Uh, we're looking at also what federal programs are available and uh, more to come on, on that as far as what is available for our community with assistance. Um, just so you know, we have set up project numbers across all departments um, to track any COVID-19 related expenditures. Um, so we look as um, in 2020, um, and we do know that we will have impacts as well in 2021 and beyond. Uh, so we're working through a plan um, with our current budget, our 2021 budget, um, and our outlook, uh, along with our, our revenue, our expense, and then also um, our reserve balances. Um, just so you know, some of the reserve balances that we have are with our emergency fund, our loan and stabilization fund. Um, we have our unassigned fund balance in the general fund. Uh, we have a capital reserve. Um, we have a fire operations reserve that we still have a balance um, in that um, <clears throat> cash account. And as far as uh, we also have department carryover. So the plan is going to be a combination as we look through the 2020 budget, but also the 2021 budget and outlook on, um, as, as Tanji said, with staffing levels, we're looking at all expense, um, revenue projections, and also a combination of all that with the use of reserves to get us through these impacts. Please let me know if you have questions. Any questions? Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. All right, yeah, thank you, sir. Um, Maureen, um, we know that uh, state aid is a very uh, significant portion of our uh, of our uh, funds. Um, any idea? Have you heard gotten any indication from the state? I've uh, heard that the state is expecting somewhere between a twenty and a forty percent drop in revenue, which one would think that that would translate to sig significant drops in um, in the state aid that we get. Um, any ha, has there been any communication with the state? Yes, Mr. Sandy, uh, Mayor Brown, members of the council. Um, you know, initially we're looking at about a twenty five percent um, drop in state aid revenue. Where you know, more is to come on this. Um, I think they said to look at um, fifteen, sixteen levels with state aid as a beginning um, indicator. Um, really, the more people. Um, stay home and stay safe, I think will help in um, preventing any further economic impacts. So I would just reiterate um, the, the more people do that, the quicker we can get through this and move on. Um, but um, I, I don't know that anybody has the answers yet as far as um, how, how great these impacts are, but we're certainly gonna monitor them as we go forward. Thank you, any further questions for Marie? Thank you, Maureen. Next, yes, we go, May, uh, Mr. Mayor. Oh, sorry, um, I, and I, I hate to ask this because it's it, it's going to be inevitably uh, speculative, but we're anticipating these cuts in direct aid from the states, but uh, from the state. But uh, there is a tremendous amount of federal money that'll be coming to the state and and to local governments. Uh, we don't have any sense of how those might offset one another at this point. 
Um, yes, Mr. Weber, Mayor Brown, um, members of council, I know and Meredith may touch on some of the, the programs that will be coming through federal as well. Um, you know, looking at money coming in to hopefully um, help with um, in the form of forgivable loans to our small businesses, um, stimulus checks um, to um, our residents. Um, as far as what's currently available for the city, as far as our city government, I'm not clear on, on everything that's available to us at this time, but we wanna make sure we're tracking all our expenditures so we're ready um, for reimbursement if, if an opportunity arises. Thank you. Any further questions for Maureen? Thank you, Maureen. 2.2, Charlie. Sorry. That is a community economic development impacts update from community development director, Meredith Richards. Thank you, Mayor. Do you Welcome. hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, as you know, from your participation, Mayor, the city with our local partners hosted um, by a Zoom meeting, five business listening sessions this last week. Um, they were each targeted to a particular business sector um, first one was food service, um, other retail, manufacturing, professional services, and then nonprofit organizations. These were advertised um, via the mail lists of our partners for the for-profit business sec um, sectors. Our partners were um, Grand Forks Region Economic Development Corporation, the Chamber, and um, the DDA. Um, each of these um, sessions included a panel format. So for those for-profit panels, we also had um, a business sector representative that was invited by either um, the chamber or the EDC. So for the retail sector, we had Paula Anderson from Sterling Carpet One, for manufacturing, Corey Mellon from PS Industries, and for the professional services panel, um, Sean Gaddy from AE2S. Our um, nonprofit listening session was um, Friday. That in, in that case, we partnered with the Nonprofit Business Alliance, um, CANA, or Community Agency Networking Association, and the Community Foundation to kind of provide the email list to get the word out. Um, panelists for that session included um, Rachel Hafner representing the Nonprofit Business Alliance and also the ARC, um, Becca Bombach from the Community Foundation, Terry Hansen from the Grand Forks Housing Authority, and Heather um, Everson, who works for Options and is the um, co-president of CANA. Um, these were moderated. Um, the for-profit business sections were moderated by Councilperson Brett Weber, and the nonprofit one was moderated by Katie Doppler. Um, I have to compliment both our moderators on, on the great job that they did kind of organizing this um, on the fly, and we had some really good participation, and, and they kept it flowing quite smoothly. Um, I'd also like to compliment those panelists that, that joined us, um, not only for their generosity of, of the time that they spent on the actual listening sessions, but their willingness to provide contact information so that if, if one of the affected businesses wanted to discuss something in maybe a more private sector, they certainly made themselves available to that. Um, I have a sense that these were very successful and I know that we're you know, ahead of the curve statewide by doing this. So we're really going to be well positioned as we work with our um, state and federal partners to let them know what, um, what our local business needs are. And I know that some of those federal partners were in on, you know, they tuned into these listening sessions too. Um, we did have really good attendance range from about 85 to 115 participants. Um, participants were muted other than the panelists and, um, participated via the chat window, which really was kind of a, a necessity given that we had such great turnout for this. And again, compliments to our moderators for, for making it go so smoothly. Um, some common themes that we heard were um, a lot of concern for employees who have had to be let go and questions on unemployment benefits, um, questions on waiving, reducing, or rebating fees for businesses that had, had to close. Um, the comment that additional debt, even at fantastic terms, it's going to be very difficult for many small businesses to absorb. And then a real emphasis on a, you know, a shop local campaign. We need to support our homegrown businesses, um, not just for their own sake, but 
that that also helps free up the you know online shipping and supply chains by um, taking advantage of those local businesses and some of their very creative approaches is, approaches to staying open during this time of physical distancing. Um, these listening sessions seem to provide a great networking opportunity during a, a time of physical distancing. And we did really hear a lot of gratitude from the participants, um, seemed to really welcome this, this forum. And then of course, the first session did raise the, the option of, of could the city allow um, alcohol sales to be included with these takeout food sale um, and deliveries. And then of course, Mayor Brown, your executive order followed almost immediately. So that, you know, sent a very strong message that, you know, city government is listening to the needs of our, our small businesses. Um, we have videos, um, transcripts of the chat and kind of takeaway summaries for, for each of these sessions, all posted on the city web. They're under the business tab. Um, and then under business and social sustainability, you know, you can't miss it. Um, the next listening session is scheduled for this week, Wednesday the 1st, um, again, 3 o'clock. And this one is, is targeting hospitality, food and beverage, and retail businesses. And our panelist is going to include Dusty Hillebrand from um, Job Service. So, you know, to, to a previous comment, that is a key question. And so we're going to make um, his expertise available as a panelist on Wednesday. Um, we're, we're limited to 300 participants, but the link to these um, listening sessions is on the city website, just to, as the, that site that I mentioned. So um, I don't think we're gonna hit that 300 mark. So anybody who is interested in, in listening is, is certainly welcome to, to log on. Um, I do wanna reiterate that, that I think these listening sessions have put us in a very strong position with the state. Um, we're working closely with, with our counterparts at Department of Commerce, Bank of North Dakota. Um, there is, as you can imagine, a lot of information being processed right now, um, how these federal funds are going to be implemented. And, and I'm hoping that soon these listening sessions will be a little bit more about um, what we can do through these um, programs that are coming, more than just listening to what the concerns are. But, um, you know, we'll be really well positioned with our um, state counterparts that as the $1.25 billion that is going to go to the state of North Dakota gets allocated, um, we'll have a strong voice at, at the, the table as, as to how those allocations go out to North Dakota and, and Grand Forks as well. Um, so we'll be looking at resources, um, local, federal, state, um, both short, medium and long-term and we'll get the word out as we get more concrete information, whether it's through um, local programs that will be provided by the city, whether it's, you know, SBA loans or, or as, as we heard, um, people are hungry for information and we'll do our best through the city website and perhaps future um, forums similar to these listening sessions to make sure that our community members and partners know what's available to them. Um, just to close, I want to, reiterate one of the things that was noted at these listening sessions is that, you know, our economy will come back faster if we execute the public health controls very well that we have in place right now and in the days to come. And so, you know, let's remember that what we're doing now is, is to come out of this strong and safe on, on the other side. And as Governor Burgum says, be North Dakota smart. Thank you, well said. Any questions for Meredith? And you can see our staff has been working tirelessly. I'm very impressed with the information we've gotten. I'm, I want to thank you for what you've done. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Mayor, I think, uh, I think it's important for uh, especially small businesses, but, but people in general in our community to recognize the hierarchy of, of uh, the funds. Obviously, the feds have the most funds of any organization. And so first line of defense, specifically for businesses would be SBA and SBA loans. And after that would be uh, any, uh, um, any funding, any loans, any grants made available at some point by the state. And then hopefully the city of Grand Forks through the mayor's leadership might be able to help as well. But um, people need to know that um, unfortunately people other than the federal government, nobody with uh, their, uh, their stimulus, nobody else is going to be bringing checks to people's homes. 
So you need to take care of yourself. You need to be wise and, and uh, set t- now is the time to be savvy. I know some of our small businesses are being savvy and are doing a good job. Um, but, but even people, and, and it's really unfortunate that uh, there, other than the stimulus, there isn't a whole lot of money this minute for uh, um, people that are working day in and day out in our community and across the state and the country. Um, but being savvy and trying to figure out where the resources are for you is important. Um, if you are laid off, um, go in and uh, look, look to your unemployment and see what you can do there. Um, but then, um, of course, hopefully the feds, the state, and perhaps the city of Grand Forks might be able to, to help with the backstop at some point. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Yeah, Mr. Weber. I'd, I'd like to uh, completely concur with uh, Mr. Sandy, what he said there. Uh, we need to see what these federal dollars are going to look like uh, coming to our state and our community, see what decisions are going to be made by the state. Uh, in the meantime, these listening sessions, uh, we need to uh, take the information we're gathering from local businesses and see what the city can do in terms of being nimble and uh, flexible with uh, ordinances and, and other possibilities. And then ultimately, once we have a clearer sense of the picture, uh, this is obviously a time for economic development and uh, uh, we need to be creative and thoughtful looking forward as we de- uh, develop the uh, economic and social recovery plan that you uh, called for. Well, thank you. Thank you, Meredith. And now 2.3. Other city administrative updates. Mr. Phelan. Mayor Ronaldson, I have quickly have uh, Mr. Gangler give us a census update um, okay. since we're approaching April 1st. And then I just have a couple few other updates for you. So Mr. Gangler, who here has done their census? Raise your hands. <laughs> I better see them all go up. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Yeah. You got the message out. Yes. Well, I. I think first of all, it's important to note, it's almost stating the obvious that the crisis we're in right now further stresses the importance of uh, completing your census as so many different funding sources are based on on population. Uh, So just a quick update, Um, the census deadline has been moved to August 15th. Um, Almost all field, if not all field operations have been postponed but you can still complete your census online just by going to my2020census.gov. Uh, literally takes five minutes. Uh, you can use the 12 digit code if you received your invitation from the census, but if you don't, you can still uh, fill out your census by putting in your, your address and that information and then it'll lead you to the actual uh, survey. Uh, on a brighter note, uh, Stephanie Halford, one of our senior planners, did an interview with uh, the KBLY uh, North Dakota Today Show. Uh, was asked a series of questions relating to the census, and that will air on April 1st, which is the uh, official census day. Uh, it's also good to know or to remind people that uh, our college students, that even though they're still on a prolonged uh, stay away from college, they still should be counted in the city that they go to school in. So easy message, if you're a UND student, you're sitting at home or, or wherever, uh, you need to count in Grand Forks for so many different reasons. Um, also a number of us uh, working on a social media push uh, to focus primarily on UND students, as I just stated. And then uh, non-English speaking populations, there's some ideas that we're uh, we're throwing around to get that going. And then the housing authority, um, we will be providing them with approximately 500 census flyers that they will then distribute to their tenants in their uh, complexes that they either own or uh, manage throughout town. And lastly, there is uh, an online map that you can go to that will show uh, rolling updates on the percentages of self-response uh, all the way from the national level down to the actual census track. So if you're interested, it's a good tool for those of us that are working on it because we can uh, check in and click on Grand Forks and click on each census track to determine 
to date, what percentage of self responders have completed it versus uh, the census from 2010. So it's kind of a, a racial comparison. Um, and thankfully this time it's, it's, uh, it's on the fly. Uh, if you're curious about the map, you could just Google uh, census response rate map and it'll uh, uh, take you to, uh, to the appropriate link. Um, but other than that, um, that's uh, the update for now. Thank you, Mr. Gangler. Mr. Sandy. Um, Mr. Gangler, um, any chance uh, the University of North Dakota would be willing to email or Snapchat or whatever it is that they do to reach their students uh, to get that message? Um, because, of course, uh, it's going to be much easier for them to reach the students than, than us on this Zoom meeting tonight. Yep, that has been in play for... Uh for a number of weeks now. Um, we had started meeting with them earlier on before this crisis. And then uh, most recently, I know Greta, I think has had some conversations with UND and uh, they are, I believe, making every attempt possible to make sure that they, uh, that they stay in touch with their students and get the word out. I don't know if Greta has anything else to uh, add to that. This is Katie, but I do know that they are sending out emails for their student involvement um, that go out, I think, twice a month at the very least that has included the information as well as their Instagram accounts that they have um, have been pushing out. Well. So I know that they are trying to reach their students through um, some of their different communication channels. Yeah, and if I could add, um, uh, we believe that the uh, uh, Group quarters on campus, uh, you know, the dorms and all those uh, housing units that are owned by the university. Um, it's our understanding that they have been accounted for or will soon be accounted for. Uh, the same way with the air base. Um, I, I think there's either a plan or a plan in the makes to make sure our uh, Air Force friends are counted as well. Good. <laughs> Mr. Phelan. Two more updates. Uh, uh, Mayor, as you discussed at your State of the City address, you know, it's all about essential services and protect and serve. So a huge shout out. We, we've organized ourselves into three teams as part of this. You have public health and emergency uh, management. You have public safety with police, fire, and PSAP. And then, of course, public works, waterworks, and public transit. They're doing the day-to-day -day services. Here at City Hall, we've broken our teams into human resources. You heard Tanji tonight. Finance, you've heard Marine. IT as Adam Johnson and pub, um, public information with Pete and public information. So we've organized ourselves between essential services, City Hall as our support organization. And then finally, you heard Meredith Richards tonight talking about community and economic development as part of the way forward. So uh, we'll continue to operate it under those teams under this uh, emergency situation that we are in and uh, to continue to move forward. Mayor, you have directed 10, uh, mayoral um, orders so far uh, at this point in time they are posted on on our we website for people who want to review uh, what you've done so far uh, just on the the cares act there was a um, uh, governor Ber bergam had a briefing he had our, our senators uh, hoven and kramer as part of that uh, some of the initial briefings were the north dakota is expected to get about 1.25 billion and they talked a lot about the sba loans and as a Governor Bergen cleverly said their loans disguised as, as grants. They turn into grants with certain uh, conditions are met as part of that. So you want to emphasize that. They did talk about robust unemployment benefits uh, to the point of it's, it might be even be better for some that um, as opposed to working. So just so everyone knows that. They talked about direct payments. Um, they talked about healthcare institutions. There's going to be a, a lot of funds going to healthcare institutions, knowing that this is a, a major hit not only on the COVID crisis that we're in, but also in in routine business that is not being conducted by healthcare institutions. That is certainly going to impact our community through alter health system. Uh, they talked about COVID reimbursements, and uh, I think that's where the city of Grand Forks is going to participate in some reimbursements. And then finally, they talked about block grants that are coming our way, and I think that's where Meredith and her team and community development are going to be really effective working with our partners and how we can shape that um, moving into the future. So really proud of the team. It's been a whirlwind. 
to get us to where we are here um, with the flood response and particularly with the COVID. I'm really proud of all the presenters tonight. It shows the caliber of people we have, not only on, on camera, but um, out in the street doing uh, really great things. And, and you should know, Mayor, and the city council should know we, we lo love and appreciate your support, but the dedication we have for city employees to deliver on behalf of the citizens of Grand Forks is incredible. And it really has been demonstrated during these trying times. So a uh, huge shout out to all of our city employees trying to citizens of Grand Forks. And we're gonna try to do the best we can over the next uh, several weeks as we continue on. So that's all that I have, Mayor. Well, thank you. I wanna say thank you to the public information. I think this worked very well. Everyone was able to stay home. They do practice our physical distancing and we had a very informative meeting tonight. So I want to thank everyone. The next item on the is uh, item three adjournment. With that, so moved. Stand. How's that, Mr. White? Making a motion to adjourn, Mayor. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Second, Mr. Sandy. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. We stand adjourned. Thank you.